the conversation didn't didn't end as well as I thought it would be. Usually he gives more like words of advice and he's just like more present, but like for some reason like I left that conversation like feeling like he was there, but like on a weird in a weird way, like it didn't feel right. And I was like, okay, like why did you why were you so distant? And I would I called him again and it was the shortest phone phone call ever and he was like, I just have to, I have to do something and like I'll call you back later. And I was like, oh, okay. Bye, I love you. And he's like, love you too. And it was just, it, there was no emotion. Like, I was just really confused. And um, that was the last time I talked to him. That Tuesday night, his girlfriend, Megan Noterer, was in town for a visit with Seau. Noterer left for the gym Wednesday morning on May 2nd. When she returned to the home, it was quiet. She looked for Seau and found his body with a 357 caliber magnum revolver gunshot wound to the chest on the bed in a guest room. Today we're going to be discussing the life and football career of Junior Seau, a legendary linebacker that I personally grew up watching. And whenever he wasn't an absolute legend on the field, off the field, he was a very community-minded, friendly individual, a man that was dedicated to his heritage and was considered as Southern California's son. Now guys, before we get to the content, these dark side of the NFL documentaries take many, many, many hours to produce. So if you could take a minute just to leave a like to help this video grow in the YouTube algorithm so our hard work could pay off, I would greatly appreciate it. On top of that, if you could subscribe and turn on my notifications if you happen to enjoy the content, I would appreciate that as well. I also live stream on Twitch on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Sundays at 9 p.m. Pacific time. And now that we got all that out of the way, break! Junior Seau was known to treat everyone like family from day one. A huge smile, star on the field, and a successful restaurateur. However, behind that smile, within his head that was full of football plays and memories of a brilliant 20-year NFL career, was darkness. As when he turned 43 years old, just after his NFL career, Junior would take his own life in 2012. The entire world wondered what happened to the 10-time All-Pro linebacker, but somehow inquired if his brain, due to years of hits on the football field, was much different in his post-retirement days, and even if those changes inside his head may have contributed to his premature death at his own hands. Veteran NFL writer and football analyst Jim Trotter would tell NPR in 2015, in his 20 years in the NFL, this is a guy that had over 1,400 tackles, and not once was he ever diagnosed with a concussion. And yet, in talking to his ex-wife and others, they will tell you he had many concussions. In fact, he would say it to her. He would call her after the game. She'd be at home, and she'd be like, hey, what happened on this play? Why weren't you there? And he'd say, oh, I just had a concussion. Junior Seau was born Tianu Bao Seau Jr. in palm tree dotted Oceanside, California, the youngest of five children born from American Samoa parents in 1969. Shortly after his birth, his family moved to the American Samoa for several years before returning to California. Junior in his brother's bedroom was a one-bedroom garage in the beach town north of San Diego. Junior initially spoke his native language and did not learn English until he was seven years old, but progressed quickly as an athlete. Seau was a three-sport varsity athlete in high school at Oceanside High, and as a starting linebacker and tight end for the football team, he earned Avocado League Offensive MVP and led his small Oceanside Pirates team to the San San Diego 2A Championship. Junior was also selected to Parade Magazine's high school All-American team. Although earning academic honors in high school with a 3.6 GPA, when he went on to attend USC to play football, he had to sit out his freshman year due to a low SAT score. 
Once eligible to play, he ruled the defensive side at USC in 1988 and 1989 with his 18 sacks in 1989 getting him a unanimous first-team All-American selection. Also in 1989, Junior Seau's first son, Tyler, was born to his high school sweetheart, in which he separated with when Tyler was just over a year and a half old. As with many All-Americans, Junior Seau would be headed to the league. Seau would be selected fifth overall by his hometown San Diego Chargers in 1990 and quickly became a starter, making 80 five tackles in his rookie season and being named to his first Pro Bowl, in which he would be named 11 more times in a row. Seau's number 55 jerseys began to fill the stands and he was nicknamed the Tasmanian Devil. He quickly became one of San Diego's most beloved athletes. Seau would celebrate big plays with a fist pumping dance and was the charismatic player that NFL fans took an affinity towards. In his second year campaign for the Chargers, Junior would start another streak of awards with putting up an all-pro performance, his first of six all-pros in a row. Also that year, Seau married Gina DeBoer. The couple had three children together, a daughter, Sydney, and two sons, Jake and Hunter, before divorcing in 2002. Junior Seau was quickly growing up on and off of the field. In 1992, Junior Seau would launch his foundation, which was focused on helping people of all ages have access to facilities and a means to exercise. During the 1994 season, the Chargers, thanks to Seau's defensive prowess, won the AFC Championship and appeared in their first and only Super Bowl. In that season, with a record 155 tackles, 5.5 sacks, and three fumble recoveries, Junior Seau would be named NFL Defensive Player of the Year. Although the Chargers would fall to the 49ers in the Super Bowl, Seau had a solid performance finishing with nine solo tackles and even a sack on Steve Young. In 1996, the Seau Fitness Center gym in Oceanside officially opened its doors, thanks to the grants and money earned from the Junior Seau Foundation. Around the same time, Seau became savvy with his investments and opened a restaurant in Mission Valley that would be successful for years to come. Junior continued with the Chargers until April 2003, when he was traded to the Miami Dolphins and started 15 games for them. In 2004, while with the Dolphins, Seau tore a pectoral muscle and in 2005, his season would end prematurely with an Achilles injury. Miami would release him in the spring of 2006, and in August he would announce his retirement in a tear-filled press conference, but a few days later would sign with the New England Patriots. During the 2006 season, Seau started 10 games and logged 69 tackles before being put on the injured reserve list at the end of November. For the next season, Junior Seau was named as one of the Patriots' captains and proved to be a mentor in the locker room to many young players and although he no longer was a regular starter, he was a solid contributor and started the two playoff games prior to the Patriots' loss to the Giants in the Super Bowl. The Patriots did not sign Seau again until very late in the 2008 season, when defensive injuries caused them to seek him out again for a starting role in two of the three late season games. The typical all-business Seau hit the media spotlight in a unique way while during a late December game, a fan ran onto the sideline at Gillette Stadium attempting to tackle Seau. The fan was arrested for trespassing, assault and battery, but Junior Seau laughed it off stating that he thought the fan was rather happy to see him. The 2009 season was Seau's final season in the NFL as he started 7 games and recorded 14 tackles as a backup linebacker. In the summer of 2010, Junior Seau officially hung up his cleats and retired after playing in 268 games, recording 1,846 career tackles, 56 and a half sacks, 18 interceptions, and 11 forced fumbles. His plan was to be a businessman, play his ukulele, become an investor, focus on his foundation, and hopefully become a television analyst. If anyone was well prepared for the transition, I thought it was Junior Seau, said Warren Moon, a member of his foundation board. He had a great foundation that had been in place for years. He had a business that at one time had been successful. I thought he was in pretty good shape. However, the money he had earned from his lengthy NFL career would be mismanaged and other issues would arise that ultimately would lead to cloudy days for Seau in sunny California. 
In October 2010, Junior Seau was arrested for domestic violence when his live-in girlfriend, a 25-year-old by the name of Mary Nolan, called police stating Seau had gotten physical while they were having an argument after Mary discovered that Junior had been unfaithful to her. After being released on bail the next morning, Junior Seau suffered minor injuries in a crash that sent his Cadillac Escalade tumbling over a cliff landing on the beach a hundred feet below, just south of Oceanside in the town of Carlsbad. There was more trouble in his life too. According to a San Diego Tribune article, Seau owed $1.3 million in casino markers to the Bellagio and Caesars Palace in November of 2010. In addition, he was losing $60,000 to $70,000 a month because of a not-so-successful investment in Ruby Tuesday's restaurant franchises. While his own restaurant that had been open for several years, Seau's was also in need of upgrades that he couldn't afford. Seau was funding his lifestyle, supporting his parents and his children, and contributing to his extended family and friends. It wasn't just financial woes that were haunting Junior Seau. His post-playing days would include drinking, prescription drugs, strained relationships, and depression. Junior Seau was having difficulties finding his post-retirement niche. He wasn't able to land a prominent broadcasting job. He would try to host a 10-episode television reality series on Versus titled Sports Jobs with Junior Seau, while he should have been spending more time with his family and children because they felt that he was rather distant. Junior Seau was struggling and soon began drinking frequently. Friend and former NFL Hall of Fame quarterback Warren Moon said of Seau, the drinking was heavy, really heavy, and there were lots of fights. He got very violent when he drank. Seau's friends knew that he needed help, but very few had that conversation with him. After falling into a deep depression after the car crash, Seau knew he needed help with his alcohol dependency. Seau would attend a few 12-step meetings with Bette Hoffman, the former longtime executive director of the Junior Seau Foundation, and Hoffman had even called the Betty Ford Center, a rehab center on Seau's behalf. Seau felt uneasy during the AA meeting, so he committed himself to attending Tuesday morning breakfast meetings instead, where local successful men spoke about their lives and also their challenges. Junior Seau began attending Bible studies and he attempted to repair distant relationships with his children, especially his oldest, Tyler. His girlfriend, Mary Nolan, his former USC teammate and former alcoholic himself, Aaron Taylor, his high school sweetheart, Melissa Waldrop, and Bet Hoffman may have been the only people who knew Seau was trying to stop drinking, and Seau was notorious for having hundreds of friends. Just over a year after the Carlsbad Cliff incident, which many people were beginning to think that the crash may have been a suicide attempt, things seemed to be getting better for Seau. The San Diego Chargers were inducting Junior Seau into their ring of honor, which meant a party in Canton wouldn't be too far away. Mary Nolan and Seau had broken up but remained close, but a striking redhead by the name of Megan Noderer was Seau's new girlfriend standing by his side along with the three of his children. Sydney, his daughter, although hesitant about attending, did so to support her father. And she made her brothers, Tyler and Hunter, attend as well, but Jake refused to attend. That event connected Sydney and Tyler back to their father, and they started to speak with and spend more time with Junior. But beginning in the spring of 2012, there were signs that Junior Seau wasn't doing as well as everyone thought he was. In early April, Seau's son Hunter, just 11 years old, was spending the weekend at his dad's house in Oceanside, and after waking up to let a dog out at 3 a.m., observed his father's bedroom light on. He looked in the room to see his dad, glassy-eyed, sitting up in bed, staring at the TV, which was off. Hunter asked if his dad was okay, and he replied with, I'm fine, son, go back to bed. Hunter, even at 11 years old, didn't believe him. Returning to his room, thinking while looking at family photos, he thought to himself that something was very, very wrong with his dad, and he didn't want to stay the night at that house ever again. On April 24th, 2012, one of Seau's former teammates, Mark Walchak, visited Oceanside to celebrate his 50th birthday. They spent five days together hanging out, Walchak playing his guitar and Seau his ukulele. 
Walchak told Seau that they should promise to take care of each other when they grew old. And Walchak said that Junior told him in that visit, There's nothing insurmountable. As long as you're here, you'll always be loved. As long as you're here, you'll never be broke. On Monday, April 30th, Junior Seau played in a benefit golf tournament in Dana Point with fellow NFL stars. And everyone who saw him that day, including his playing partner Jerry Rice, said that Seau was enjoying himself and was the happy-go-lucky guy everyone typically observed. After the tournament on that same day, Seau phoned his friend, songwriter Jamie Paulin, who didn't pick up his phone. On the voicemail that was left was Seau saying, buddy, with him singing a few lyrics from his favorite country song, Who I Ain't. Cause I broke the hearts of angels, cursed my fellow man, turned from the Bible with a bottle in my hand. My only hope for forgiveness when the good Lord calls my name is that he knows who I am and who I ain't. On Tuesday, May 1st, Seau sent a group text to Gina, his ex-wife, and his children, Tyler, Sydney, Jake, and Hunter, with the three words, I love you. Sydney told Frontline that, He always texted me that he loved me, so it wasn't anything new. It was weird. I had no idea he knew how to send a group message. That was what actually came to mind, and I was like, what? You know how to work your phone? That's so weird. Like, you never know how to do anything. Like, how did, it, how did you learn this? But, um, no, it, it was just like any other, like, I love you, because that's something I would hear from him every time I saw him. There was never a goodbye without an I love you attached. So when I saw that, I was like, okay, dad, sure, like, love you too. It, was, it wasn't big until it was the last text which I received, until I knew. That Tuesday night, his girlfriend Megan Noterer was in town for a visit with Seau where they would have dinner and watch Laker basketball together. Noterer left for the gym Wednesday morning on May 2nd around 7.45 a.m. and sometime shortly after, Seau left the lyrics to the song Who I Ain't on a hand-scribbled note on the kitchen counter. After Megan left the gym at 9.15, she tried to call Seau several times, but he did not answer. So she went looking for him at the gym that he would often work out at, but didn't see him or his car there. When she returned to the home, it was quiet, and she found his dog, Rock, in the living room, where he typically never spent time. She looked for Seau and found his body with a 357 caliber magnum revolver gunshot wound to the chest on the bed in a guest room. Megan Noterer would call 911 at 9.36 a.m., hyperventilating and in frantic cries, and via the Oceanside Fire Department on the call, tried to revive Seau but was unsuccessful. Seau's friends and family were called and they paid their respects as he was carried out of the house, through the garage, on a gurney. By later that afternoon, the entire world knew that former football legend Junior Seau had taken his own life. The autopsy report released several months later found that Seau's body contained no illegal drugs or alcohol, but did show traces of zolpidum, a drug used to treat insomnia. At Seau's service, Jamie Paulin played the song Who I Ain't at the cemetery while friends and family wept. Paulin told the San Diego Tribune it was probably the toughest thing I've ever done in my whole life. He loved that song because there was truly forgiveness in it. It said that he knows who I am in my heart and that the other stuff is just what happens in life. It's circumstances, it's poor decisions or good decisions or whatever. Junior Seau's children and his ex-wife Gina were thrown into handling Seau's casino debts and other obligations and decided to close his restaurant and eventually sell his $3 million Oceanside home. During the grieving process, there was more on their mind of why Seau chose to end his life so abruptly. Two months following Seau's death, Tyler and Sydney became outspoken that they would donate their father's brain to the National Institutes of Health for research into long-term brain damage in football players due to concussion-related injuries. They also filed a wrongful death lawsuit 
against the NFL and opted out of the 675 million concussion settlement covering more than 20,000 former NFL players that would pay up to 5 million to families of players like Seau who were found to have CTE. In January of 2013, the NIH announced the results on the research of Seau's brain, that the findings were consistent with chronic traumatic encephalopathy, CTE, the degenerative brain disease, the type of findings seen in Mr. Seau's brain may have been recently reported in the autopsies of individuals with exposure to repetitive head injury, including professional and amateur athletes who played contact sports, individuals with multiple concussions, and veterans exposed to blast injury and other trauma. The disease was known to lead to dementia, memory loss, and depression. Seau's ex-wife Gina said in an interview with ABC News and ESPN, I think it's important for everyone to know that Junior did indeed suffer from CTE. It's important that we take steps to help these players. We certainly don't want to see anything like this happen again to any of our athletes. In August of 2015, Junior Seau was inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Sydney Seau, Junior's daughter, was not allowed to give her speech on stage in Canton, Ohio. The Hall of Fame instead showed a five-minute video about Seau's playing career, including an interview with Sydney that did not mention his suicide or the ultimate diagnosis of CTE. Sydney told the New York Times just before the ceremony, it's frustrating because the induction is for my father and for the other players. But then to not be able to speak, it's painful. I just want to give the speech he would have given. It wasn't going to be about this mess. My speech was solely about him. In 2018, the Seau family dismissed their case against the NFL and said they had reached a confidential settlement. Junior Seau is one of the greatest defensive players of all time, and this story should demonstrate the concern amongst NFL players' safety with the amount of trauma that their brain and their head sustains while they're playing the sport of football. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure to leave a like to help the channel grow and to check out any of our other episodes in our Dark Stories of the NFL series. Aside from that, I'm Mike, and I'm dropping the mic until our next upload.